Global India Network. Print, TV, events, podcasts. Find out more at globalindianseries.com. Welcome back to the world's greatest conversations and the official platform for people of Indian origin. Yes, let's face it, we are everywhere. Now you know, every single week we plunge into the human experience behind our perceptions of identity, take a second look at the countries we now call home, and tackle the big conversations. This week we meet with a dear friend of mine, Amand Beersley. Now, Amand is a very well-known face for many people in the UK. He's been on hit shows such as How to Look Good Naked on the BBC. He's also been involved in Fake Over. So these are some of the most iconic things that look at people, identity and the way we look and the challenges of beauty. But in this session, Amand runs me through a really interesting subject area. And essentially, it's about what we put on our bodies knowingly as well. And it's a really interesting one because in this world where we're all speaking about climate change, we're speaking about the travesties of the world, we tend to forget that as consumers, we also have a choice within there and we have to take that social custodianship up. It is a fascinating discussion. And as always, I'd like to say a massive thank you to all our dear supporters out there. If you too would like to get involved in these incredible 50 Shades of Brand discussions, well, it couldn't be easier. Simply come to the website, which is www.globalindianseries.com. But before we start, let's kick off with our 50 Shades of Brand news on the 16th of March, 2022. I'll be taking the lead with this one. So um, with great power comes great responsibility. Do wish me luck. So let's kick with South Africa. The NC government is being forced to discuss the apartheid legacy and has been confronted by the growing inequality with unemployment on the rise with over 35% and over 300 deaths and last year's violence. The government is now questioning whether it scraps the welfare system. In Malaysia, PM Yakub, through his new coalition, scored a landslide victory in a key election test day. It raises hope that the new government will be sworn in over the past turbulent years. In Antigua, Prime Minister Gaston Brand has petitioned the EU over its plans to scrap visa-free access to its citizens. Antigua, alongside many of the Caribbean, run a program called Citizenship by Investment. You can find out more on our website. The industry as a whole has faced many troubles and the recent conflict in Europe may signal the beginning of the end, unless, of course, action is taken. In India, a British international kabaddi player was shot dead in India whilst vigilating a tournament. The Indian police have launched a full-scale investigation and it seems that this was intentional. And finally, in the UK, Nazim Sakari Radcliffe, a British citizen who has been held in Tehran since 2016 on charges of plotting to overthrow the government, has just had her passport returned. Raising hopes for her release, Nazim has strenuously denied all the allegations put against her. Hi, my name is Divya and I'm co-founder of the Global Indian Podcast. Before you get to today's show, I've got a quick favour to ask. If you've been enjoying our conversations, I'd love if you could take just one minute to leave us a review on the platform that you're listening to us on and share our work to friends and family. It helps us out a lot. Word of mouth is the primary way that we grow. Thanks for your continued support. Hi, my name is Nestor Alfred, CEO of St. Lucia Citizenship by Investment. Think freedom. What comes to mind? Freedom to explore to travel to any destination for work or play? Or is it freedom of expression, being surrounded by the globally minded, those who care for society and environment? Every year, people from around the world apply for St. Lucian citizenship because they realize that real freedom is based on choice. Discover more about St. Lucian citizenship and how it's helping global Indians achieve more. My name is Chitra Stern, and I am a proud Global Indian Ambassador and CEO of Martignal Resorts and Martignal Residences. We pride ourselves on the journeys that define a community, and our developments bring people together. Did you know that over 70,000 people just like us call Portugal home? The Global Indian journey has brought people together in a meaningful way, and on behalf of all of us at Martignal, we want to thank you for joining us in these remarkable conversations. We look forward to seeing you here in Lisbon post-COVID. Have a great day. And just move. Get up and just move. Get up and just move. Get up and just move. For me, 
what's it like to be me? Um, it, there's never a dull moment. It's, um, I'm constantly trying to evolve. And for many, many years, I just bumbled my way through, through life. There was no, I never had a five year plan, I never had a 10 year plan. Um, the only thing I kind of knew what I wanted to do was be an actor. Um, so I kind of managed to do that. Uh, but for me, it's, I'm just fascinated with day-to-day -day life and, and the mundane things. I'm obsessed with the sky. Um, I love, the more the time has gone by, the more that I've got into my breath work and, and enjoying stillness. So I am changing, I think, and evolving on a day-to-day -day basis. But am I aware of what it's like to be me? Not really. I just, I don't have any thoughts on it. I think that's a powerful way to put it. I, you, you caught me in the breath worth because I think our mutual friend knows I'm really into the whim hopping right now. So I've been doing this for quite a wow. while. So it's um, no great. Well, look, I'm on you. I know when you reached out and we spoke about this, you you got this incredible product that is around the area of cruelty free makeup. Now, just to give people a back end into how you got into this, you're you are heavily involved in the fashion industry. Um, you've been a makeup artist. You've done a lot of work, for example, for front staff, for hotels as well as airlines. Nice. You're award winning in that type of area. But when I was having a look at this whole industry called the beauty industry, as you can tell by my manufactured look of a beard and a top, you know, it was something that was probably far <laughs> alien, far removed from my own personal being. But it's an industry that is worth over 603 billion from what you told me. But beyond the figures is actually a shocking revelation. Run us through the conversation that you want our audience to be thinking about today. Mm. Well, it's the beauty industry that's worth approximately 603 billion, not necessarily the fashion industry. That's worth a hell, hell lot more. Um, but yeah, beauty for me, um, I think I'll just give you a, a quick snippet of a background of me. Yeah. How I um, and how I managed to to get into this industry. So I just stumbled my way through it. So I, I basically came off tour. I was um, I was doing a, an acting piece in Edinburgh and uh, for the Fringe Festival, and we won an award for the best new musical on the Fringe. I needed to get some work in, and I got a job working in a department store in um, in Manchester, and on the clinic counter, actually. And for me, it was a fascination with people. It wasn't necessarily the beauty aspect of things. I just love talking to people and communication and communicating. And I think that's what drove me into acting in the first place is, is the ability to be people and to get under the skin of, of characters and people. Um, but I really started to enjoy the whole transition and beauty and learning about it. And that went on and I became a makeup artist with Givenchy and then started traveling around and doing the Oscars and BAFTA, etc. But then the more I was talking to people and the more I was put, mixing things and putting things on people's faces, I was thinking and flipping over the backs of the, of the cartons and the boxes, what do all these ingredients mean? Uh, where they all come from? So then I started to question things. And my own personal journey, I... I've always been quite spiritual and I started to get fascinated with Reiki. So probably about 18 to 20 years ago, I, I got into Reiki and started my Reiki. And I think when you have a bit of a light bulb moment like that, where you're, you're thinking, okay, so th there's an energy. Is there an energy actually in product of what I'm doing to somebody's face? So I then started to look into these ingredients and that's when I became a little bit shocked about exactly what goes into a product and how many chemicals uh, are put onto our skin. Now, I'm not the type of um, person to, to, to bash chemicals. They have their place. You know, I'm drinking a chemical now. I've got 
good old water here. Um, but some harsh chemicals can have um, a negative impact on our bodies and our skins and, and on our systems. So for me, I, I started to look at certain ingredients and also the testing nature of those ingredients and how they got into the product. And it was quite shocking. And it was only when I was introduced to the natural organic product European Expo, which took place every year in London. And I would see all these different brands and people that were making things from their kitchen and um, completely natural, but just so much love and passion going into it. Um, I really started to investigate ingredients and, um, and where they come from and what they can do to people's skin. And that's what I, I think I would encourage anybody really to do some critical thinking on everything to do with their lives, everything that we're introduced to or we um, consume. It's interesting, isn't it? That word consumer. And yeah. um, I've never really liked it. I think it it's very typical of human nature to consume and really not have any kind of um, afterthought of, of the, of the mess that we can leave behind us. So I think it's good to be a little bit more conscious and just to think where things are coming from and, and what's gone into making that. Now, when you go to your department store and you buy your favorite beauty products, ask those questions because the beauty advisors will know. They'll have a list of, of answers for you, where their products come from, um, fair trade, if the workers have been paid well for it, all those kind of things. If you're not getting the answers that you feel that you need to get, then phone the PR companies or the marketing brand and they will have all the questions for you. So I suppose the elephant in the room is, it's what are some of the things that are in makeup that makes you think, oh, we need to know more about this? Because I know we spoke off air about lipstick. When mm. I was doing a bit of research, I was really shocked because it's made from insects in some cases, the, the red pigment from that side. And so what you're really doing is that you're crushing insects. I don't know what the mechanism is. I don't know the chemical formula, but in my rudimentary mind of thinking, it's you're crushing these insects, you're using the pigment, and then you're almost plastering this across your lips, an area that then will obviously be ingested within your own body. Now, what are some of the things that you've seen that you think people need to know a bit about how these makeups get onto the counter? and the impact it can actually have on you. And we're not just talking about a moral outrage. We're talking about also chemically, the impact that it can actually have on the human body. Well, if you look at the history of, of beauty and you go right, right back, um, obviously ancient Egyptians, Sumerians, they were crushing beetles to get and creating cochineal. Cochineal is the kind of um, the pigment uh, that you were talking about. And they were doing that, you know, putting... I suppose the blood. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, we, we can make it dramatic. The carcasses of crushed beetles <laughs> and families that have been torn apart. Upon it. I, I should do my voice over there, shouldn't I? But um, wow, okay. So they were doing that yeah. with their lips. Yeah, and, and also with berries, and they were using all sorts of things and, and grinding them up and to to help adorn them. Um and cochineal obviously is still being used and and certain pigments are derived from, um, from animal origin, insects especially. And so it comes to the thoughts then of what life is sacred and, and how far do you go with your, um, your limits on, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm vegetarian, so I don't do this. Oh, no, I'm vegan, so I don't have this. Well, if you knew what was in that lipstick, do, it, it, would you would you put that on? Um, are insects' lives any any more or any less? Are they worth any more or any less? So it's th those are the ingredients that can be in there. And then when you look at some of the chemical compounds, which um, can, in a cumulative, a cumulative effect, have an impact on your health and your systems, like hormone disruptors. So there's certain ingredients um, that can naturally trigger like a hormone disruptor. So phthalates are one of them. Um, you, you've got SLS in, in some of the ingredients which are in shampoos and conditioners. 
Now, these, obviously, they've been safety tested. So the argument against it is to say, well, hang on a second, of course they're safe. You'd have to have lots of stuff on your, onto your body to absorb into your system to have some sort of negative effect. Well, how many products are people using on a daily basis? Our skin is an incredible organ. It's our largest organ. And it's there to keep things out, but also it can let things in. Um, you only have to look at things like um, hormone patches that people have been wearing or um, nicotine patches, for example. They can go into the system. So if the molecular structure of an ingredient is small enough, it can get into your blood system and it can have an effect. So our bodies are very, very... Um, very delicate, but yet quite robust in other ways. But I just think if you are conscious about what you put on, your shampoo, your conditioner, your body wash, your lipstick, your um, cleanser, foundation, all these things are layered upon layered upon layered. And even men, you know, the amount of products that men use, aluminium in um, deodorants, they can be quite impactful in a negative way um, because you're spraying them under your armpits. And if it's got aluminium in there, that can have a clogging effect. So if you're blocking up the pores and your sweat glands from sweating, certainly these ones that last for 24 hours, you know, sweat free, your body's got to eliminate that somehow. So in some, in some cases, it can force it through the back. So you can get people that have acne on their back if they're using things like um, antiperspirants. So you just be a little bit more conscious about what you're using and how you're using it and what you, where you're using it, really. You know, it, it comes back to that beautiful statement, common sense is everything but common. And now, you, and now you're saying all this stuff to me is making me think, because you, you, know, you don't really think that through. You take it for granted, don't you? You know, you, you, you deal with the beauty industry. I know that you did this TV show. Um, you were involved in the how to look good naked type of thing. And along these whole lines, what does beauty mean to you? What do you define as beauty? I really think beauty comes from within. And I've obviously made a career on the aesthetics of, of beauty. Beauty in inverted commas. Um, what makes somebody beautiful? I've always... Um, I think the older I've got and the more I've, uh, I've moved along this particular journey, um, I'm more about frequency and energy of people. And if somebody's got a great energy to them, their beauty is boundless. And I, I always try and see the positive side of people. Um, and for me the aesthetics of beauty yes of course i i love painting faces i love but i i don't like to enforce my particular viewpoint on them i want to enhance somebody's individuality rather than make them into looking like the next person down the street i mean we've, we've gone into this territory now where with social media and you have filter upon filter upon filter and it scares the living daylights out of me where people don't recognize each other anymore unless they've got several filters on their face. And that really concerns me as well for younger people where um, how, how is their self-esteem when certainly over the last two years where people really didn't go out that much at all. And so they were communicating with Zoom um, or with um, other online platforms and on things like Instagram and, and other platforms where you can throw about three filters on you have this view of yourself which is not real at all um, and I think it's important for people to accept themselves and to to go on the journey of, of self-acceptance and to know that actually you're, you're okay, you're good, you're good enough as you are. And what I've always tried to do with, with beauty, with makeup, is to enhance that. Be playful with makeup. Of course, we've got a fabulous canvas that we've been given, 
So be playful with it, but don't, don't let it define you. Be happy enough without all the stuff on your face. Be happy enough to be bare, be confident enough to be bare. Have that self-acceptance that know, and, and your self-worth to know that actually you're enough as you are, but yeah, okay. It's like going to your wardrobe and thinking, I'm gonna put you know, that little black dress on, I'm gonna put that blue suit on. I love that blue suit, it makes me feel like this. Um, the dress makes me feel like that. And then do your makeup accordingly, or in our case, obviously we've, we've both got beards, um, you know, sh do, do a clean shave and look if you want to. Um, have a slick back hair style if you want to. G get the wax on. Experiment with how you're feeling in that particular moment, but don't be a slave to it. No, I, I absolutely agree. I think we get caught up in the content more than the purpose of things, don't we? It's mm. we look at something, and especially now with social media. Man alive, it's crazy yeah, because it's we're all individual, but we all look the same. It's, um, it's, it's, yeah. and, and there's a fear that comes in there along that channel because now you've got this plethora of beauty artists that come up on social media, TikTok, through to Instagram, through to Facebook. And I like to think that you were one of the pioneers of that prior to this whole internet revolution because your ethos behind it seems to be very different. You're not saying, well, this is how you react or this is how you make your nose look this way or your eyes this way. It's more so saying, well, this is how you can express who you are and use the canvas almost like the art pieces that you see around rather than saying, well, this is how you can mask how you feel and mask who you are by transforming yourself, almost catfishing society. Yes. Was their expectations? Now, how how cultural is our understanding of beauty? Beauty, because I know that's a very loaded question. I get it. Mm -hmm. but culturally, looking at this, how much of an impact does that have on the universal standard of what we see as beautiful and not? That's an interesting question, um, and I think obviously it depends on where you are in the world. And but now that we've got, we can reach other parts of the world with social media and with online platforms, um, we can see other faces, and we can see and experience other cultures in a, a limited way, but we can. Um, it's interesting to see different aspects of beauty. And I think in the Western world, we have this, um, seems to be a look at the moment, it's been around for a few years, um, the, the fuller lips, the higher cheekbones, um the long hair for the women and it it concerns me that you see, you i get emails from young girls 16 17 asking me to recommend where they can get lip fillers from um that these are young girls <laughs> and i've never been an advocate for any kind of invasive work each to their own. If it makes you feel happy, genuinely, it's your body, you have a right to do what you want with it, but make informed decisions because it can be a slippery slope. And I'm not one to, to judge anybody or to um, enforce my opinion on anyone, but it does concern me what people put themselves through for the sake of... Um, do they do it to feel accepted or do, do they do it to be seen? Don't know, it's an interesting question, but um, I think that they, I think that they have to be very, very careful with what they're, they're doing to themselves and what we're putting out there as a society saying that this is beautiful. Um, I think it's refreshing to see more faces, more versatile looks um, in, the media now so we've certainly seen different shades of skin tones which is great and we're seeing um also more uh, gender inclusion and um the lgbtq uh, community is, is getting more visibility as well which is great um so hopefully this is the beginning of the emergence of the individual and to know that it's okay to be different. I, I've never put myself in a box though, interestingly. I've always, because I, I never felt as if I kind of belonged 
in a certain way um, because I'm from mixed heritage and I was brought up um, with Church of England um, in the good old boys brigade. <laughs> in fact, my life was a little bit like East is East. <laughs> it was. Um, so when it, when it comes to looks and appearance and, and fitting in, I never really did, but then I never really felt the need to fit in. I was always just me, just bubbling around in the background and just evolving, hopefully. And I'd like to hope that younger generations and even, you know, our generation, do not don't be stuck in a box be who you want to be express yourself in the way you want to do it to do that um and just uh, and just learn to love yourself and learn to love the beauty that is within you and bring that out everybody has something beautiful about them and uh, you can see that in the cultures that they try and extract that particular beauty in their own way um, if you went to some of the tribes in Africa, I think it's, it's Africa or the Amazon. I can't remember where they have the Ethiopia. The, yeah, the where is it? Ethiopia in the Ethiopia. Valley, where yeah, they have the all, rings. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean that, that's fascinating. If you go back, obviously, to the geishas of Japan, where the the feet binding. I mean, it seems very extreme, but that's it's a cultural um, look for them. It's a way that their culture has obviously helped to define them in certain ways but yeah it's it's very it's very interesting to see how different cultures play with beauty and what beauty is to them yeah absolutely it's um because when when you travel enough you start to see this kaleidoscope of how we take the one idea and we change it to extreme so yeah in ethiopia down the Oma valley you have the ladies with the rings to elongate the neck and then obviously the earlobes in other areas of the world if you go towards the amazon so on the on that side of the planet, again, our perceptions of beauty change. But what's really fascinating now is with this advent of the digital revolution or evolution or whatever type of evolution it is, definitely not a solution, but the digital nomadic world is our perceptions of beauty have now been challenged hugely because now all of a sudden everybody wants to be homogeneous the way that they look, the way that they feel. <laughs> And it's like what you said before, it's, it's the aspect of, and I know it's easily said, and people can brush over it, but it is allowing the innermost truth of you to come to the surface in a positive way, and then actually work from there. Because once you do that, and you're working within your own life, well, then it's a great place to be. What's the biggest misconception people have about you? Um, probably that I... I always, I'm always looking for perfection um, or, oh, you, you have to look perfect. Oh, I'm seeing I'm on. So my makeup's got to be perfect. Oh, I'm, and really, honestly, I don't, oh, this is going to sound very odd, but I don't really look at the person. I try and look into the person if I can. I get that. Um, and as I've said before, energy is a big thing for me. So I can be quite happy just um, in a meditation circle on a retreat somewhere, or I could be very happy in um, a five-star hotel, just having a glass of champagne and, and living life. I love life in both aspects. And I think we're at a, a very unique situation where we, have got all the all this materialistic stuff around us which i can appreciate and i do but yet sometimes i find it it really just fills your your day with just nonsense a lot of the time um so i like to step away from things and just switch off sometimes and i will just have no music on um be outside I try and get outside as often as I can. I have a grounding mat. I think that's very important as well um, because of the amount of um, EMF that we have around us. I think it's important to either get out onto the grass with your bare feet or to get a grounding mat to just stop the constant chatter in your head all the time and just to have some stillness. So yeah, people 
are quite surprised when they meet me and they'll say, oh, <laughs> I thought you would be, I, I thought you would be either arrogant or I thought you would be um, uh, criticizing my makeup or the way I dress, but it's really not me at all. No, you, you come across as a true human, which is the best way to That's be. True. I was going to say last last one. It's what's your biggest fear? Because again, from your industry and the way that you look out to the world, you you see shifts and changes and cultural patterns, the way that people react with each other. What's the fear my, that you have? My fear is that we will start to devolve rather than evolve. Interesting. Okay. I think that um, I always get very disappointed when people are judgmental um there's no critical thinking um opinions are forced upon people um and globalization it is great to be part of a global community of course it is to be part of a species that hopefully we can help um nurture this planet that we've been blessed to to be upon um, rather than destroy it and um, however, I think something that's fundamentally important is building communities and supporting local and, and supporting the environment immediately around us um, and understanding our neighbours, understanding um, people that we come to on a day to day basis and just respecting differences. I think differences are important in, in a lot of ways um to help diversity to help um evolving i don't particularly like everybody merging into one um i like the individuality and i think that should be enhanced so being part of a global community is great but also understanding each other's individuality and and helping to nurture each other as well in our differences and respecting that because nothing's simple. Nothing is straightforward and simple. Um, and what I think has been really good over the past two years has been individual podcasts or things like this. You know, I think has been brilliant to actually communicate with people rather than talk at people. I've been extremely disappointed in the mainstream media, extremely disappointed in them. And I... I just hope that we can help support each other through things and just be kind and compassionate. Why have you been disappointed? What, has, what is it that you've seen that doesn't stand the test of your personal moral compass? Oh, gosh, are we going to go down a rabbit hole here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're already down the hole, mate. It's to go on. down the hole. Um, I don't know. I think bully tactics from the media, they, they try and do things where they'll have um, uh, some sort of show um, where it's a TV programme where they'll try and get people to have different um, viewpoints, but they don't really. And people are shut down for having a slightly different view on things. Um, and all these labels are bounded around and uh, to try and promote a fear narrative uh, within people. Right at the beginning of the pandemic, when all the numbers of deaths were being reported, constant deaths. But then it all came out that actually people that sadly passed away um, were obviously dying within 20 days of testing positive for COVID, but they could, they included people dying with cancer, dying from underlying health issues. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But that wasn't really made uh, public knowledge in the mainstream media as such. Um, so then you had this fear narrative that has driven people, mental health issues have been yeah. off the chart, suicide rates all time high. Um, people's businesses have been completely run into the ground. Um, and people looking at other people with just contempt and, and, and hatred, really, which is really, really upsetting for me as part of a human 
kind let's be kind <laughs> and let's be kind and be and explore our humanity within each other and the compassion with that um if you choose to have your vaccine have your vaccine if you choose not to don't have it if you choose to um support local be, be allowed to support local and shop from local produce and etc um but it's having if, that choice isn't it i think that's what you're getting fundamentally at. important fundamentally yeah. important to have choice um it really 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 is and to respect the choices of people and just um allow people as long as you're not doing harm to other per another person have a difference of opinion it's important. It's important to have that. It's important to have communication. Be, be a professional human. You don't need to be a professional lawyer. You don't need to be a professional scientist or sporting person, but be a professional bloody human. I think that's what it comes mm. down to. Because that way, then we actually allow ourselves to have empathy. And it's something that you said earlier. That's an interesting part. It's this paradigm shift. How far are we willing to go to feel a sense of belonging not saying that we truly belong, but a sense of belonging. Are we willing to change our face in order to feel that we belong? Are we willing to change our mindset or to consume, in, in other words, to destruct things in order to feel that we can ease that pain within ourselves? And that's probably what I think a lot of people are going through right now in the conscious sense, saying enough is enough. What a brilliant conversation. I'm sure you agree. Do you know what? For me personally... It was absolutely fascinating because it is this idea of what is beauty. Now, I know we're all going to be speaking out there that beauty is found within. But there's a whole industry about that. So evidently, that's not just a single case. But when you start breaking it down and you think, well, how far are we willing to go to feel a sense of beauty? And what impact does that have on society as a whole? Well, then it gets really interesting because surely we should be judged upon our beauty standards of our actions not just how our faces look with crushed beetles on our lips. I don't know, maybe that's just me on a Wednesday. Until next week, I hope all remains well. And make sure you continue following our 50 Shades of Brown discussions. Because the reality is, with your help and you listening, we get to build the world's greatest living encyclopedia of our community. Take care for now. Global Indian Network. Print. TV. Events, podcasts. Find out more at globalindianseries.com.